In a previous video, we talked about some of the best cards for returning cards to your opponent's hand, nicknamed Bounce Effects. Today, we'll be following up on that with the top 10 cards that you'd want to use for bouncing your own cards to the hand, and why you'd might want to do that. So, let's get started. Kicking us off this list at number 10, we have Endymion, the Mighty Master of Magic. This is a level 7 Dark Spellcaster Pendulum Monster with 2800 attack and a Pendulum Scale of 8. Its Pendulum Effect lets you Special Summon Endymion from your Pendulum Zone by removing 6 spell counters from your field. Destroy up to that many cards, and then place spell counters on Endymion equal to the number of cards destroyed. Its Monster Effect lets you return a card you control with a spell counter on it to your hand to negate and destroy a spell or trap card, activation, or effect. Also, while Endymion has a spell counter on it, it can't be destroyed by your own card effects or be targeted by your opponent's effects. Finally, if it's destroyed by battle, you can add a normal spell from your deck to your hand if it had a spell counter on it. Endymion is a namesake of one of the most powerful pendulum archetypes ever. The deck revolves around flooding the field with incredible powerful negation effects like Endymion himself, Odd Eyes Vortex Dragon, and Mythical Beast Jackal King to lock your opponent out of the game with a flurry of negation effects. Endymion's ability to negate while returning cards to the hand works especially well with pendulum cards, as you're able to return your monsters after they've used their effects to give you follow-up on the next turn, either to pendulum summon or re-establish your pendulum scales. In a more modern context, Endymion has even received powerful legacy support in the form of Selene, Queen of Master Magicians. She can special summon spellcasters from the hand or graveyard as a quick effect. This combines exceedingly well with Endymion, whose negation effect is not a hard once per turn. So you can use it, bounce it to your hand, and resummon with Selene to add another negation. This also works with Mythical Beast Jackal King, who similarly lacks a hard once per turn. Self-bouncing for pendulums has always been fairly powerful as a way to rebuild boards, as seen with powerful banned cards like Magispector Unicorn Kirin, because of just how well pendulums can play out of the hand with pendulum summoning and scale setting. Speaking of banned card, Endymion's power level in 2019, alongside some other pendulum strategies, are responsible for the banning of the infamously powerful pendulum extender Heavy Metal Foes Electromite. It even got one of its support cards and best starters, Servant of Endymion, limited for a few years until it was just recently taken off the list. Endymion's an incredibly powerful card, and was strong enough to carry an entire archetype to meta relevance for a time. Next up at number 9, we have Mist Valley Apex Avian. This is a level 7 Winged Beast Monster 2700 attack. Its effect is that once per chain, you can target one Mist Valley card you control, return that target to the hand, and negate the activation of a card or effect and destroy it. Mist Valley Apex Avian is most notable in modern Yu-Gi-Oh for its inclusion in Flunder Reese decks. It's easily searchable off of Flunder Reese and Eaglin, and is a deck's go-to option for an answer to powerful spell and trap effects, as the deck's other cards like Flunder Reese and Mpen and Flunder Reese and Dreamy Town handle monsters. Apex Avian's lack of a hard once per turn or its ability to bounce itself means that just like with Endymion beforehand, any deck that can summon multiple times on your opponent's turn can out multiple negates in a row. Something Fluendarese could do frequently, as the deck is infamous for summoning big winged beast monsters on your opponent's turn thanks to its chain normal summon strategy. Apex Avian saw play even outside of Fluendarese in a couple of different historical decks too. Back when Pendulum archetypes dominated the game, it wasn't uncommon to see Pendulum Magician style decks running Avian, as they could frequently Pendulum summon to the field for an easy negate. Perhaps the most degenerate and abusable aspect of Apex Avian is how it combines with its fellow archetype monster, Mist Valley Thunderbird. A card that would bounce to the hand, special summon itself to the field. Back before the banning of Bolt Morgue, Burn of Sovereignty, and Union Carrier, many decks could easily end on a board with Mist Valley Apex Avian that could continuously bounce and resummon Mist Valley Thunderbird, giving you an unlimited amount of negation effects so long as your opponent couldn't interrupt it mid chain. This is self bouncing taken to one of the most powerful extremes, which is one of the core themes and abilities of the Mist Valley archetype. And at number 8, we have Lunalite Yellow Martin. This is a level 4 Dark Beast Warrior monster. Its effect says that, if Martin is in your hand or graveyard, you can bounce a Lunalite card you control and special summon Martin, but banish it when it leaves the field. Also, when it's sent to the graveyard, you can add a Lunalite Spell or Trap from your deck to your hand. Lunalite Yellow Martin is one of the core cards in the Once Upon a Time metagame dominant Lunalite deck, alongside its sisters in crime, Lunalite Tiger and Lunalite Kaleidachick. Yellow Martin was a standout because of just how much advantage it could occur through all of its effects. Its primary ability was to special summon itself while bouncing a Lunalite Tiger, letting you reuse Lunalite Tiger's soft once per turn pendulum effect to special summon a Lunalite monster from the graveyard. It even gave you a little bit of extra extension along the way by searching Lunalite Serenade Dance, which could be later banished from the graveyard to get another free special summon from the deck for a Lunalite monster. This formed the bones of an incredibly powerful rank 4 strategy that accessed monsters like Abyss Dweller, as well as impressive Link Spamps like Curious Light Sworn Dominion. This dual nature and dark centric monster base made it one of the prime abusers of Outer Entity Azathoth, 
thanks to an easy access to Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardiche and the ability to make the rank 4s needed to abuse the Phantom Knight ranks of Magic Launch to summon Azathoth on your opponent's turn. The deck was often used in combination with other Dark Center archetypes like Orcist or Danger Engines to bolster both of these XCs and Link Summoning capabilities. It was arguably the best deck of its time before the ban list assembled not just Lunalight by limiting Lunalight Tiger, but also hitting Dangers and Orcus cards as well. And this was in no small part due to Yellow Martin's highly synergistic ability to bounce your own Lunalites to your hand. A simple interaction, but a powerful one. And at number 7, we have Graffa, Dragon Lord of Dark World. This is a level 8 Dark Fiend monster with 2700 attack that can special summon itself from the graveyard by returning a Dark World monster you control to your hand. It also has a classic Dark World effect that triggers when discard to the graveyard by a card effect. In Graffa's case, you can target one card your opponent controls and destroy it. And if your opponent's effect discarded it, you can look at a random card in your opponent's hand. And if it's a monster, special summon it to your field. Graffa is a legacy support that took Dark World from an on-again, off-again threat to a real powerhouse back in 2011. Its ability to put whatever Dark World monster you have access to in hand to set up their discard effects really allowed a deck with some consistency issues to engineer more powerful and specific plays. Originally, it would just let you turn any Dark World you could discard to summon itself onto the field into Graffa itself. Couple that with the Graffa clearing the cards off the board, then you discard to the graveyard and you have a recursive threat that could help you break boards. Graffa saw play in basically every iteration of Dark World through the years because of these qualities. Even in tier 1 variants like Danger Dark World decks that could both FDK your opponent thanks to Firewall Dragon, or just win on the sheer special summon capability of Dark World monsters combined with the Danger Archetypes drawing and discarding synergies. With more modern support, Graffa's ability to bounce your own Dark Worlds allows for Dark World decks to continually recycle the effect of Silva, Warlord of Dark World. Silva summons itself and discard it, but just as importantly, discards an opponent's card when discarded by an opponent's card effect. Both Graffa and Silva have no hard ones per turn. So in combination with Cerulee, Guru of Dark World, you could force your opponent to have a monster that made you discard a card. Discard Silva, summon it, rip a card of your opponent's hand, and bounce Silva back to your hand with Graffa to repeat it all over again. Enabling multiple hand rips on your first turn, as well as just being a great way to recycle whichever Dark World monsters you want. Graffa's been a powerhouse card for over a decade thanks to multiple different ways in which its self-bouncing and self-summoning ability have benefited a ton of different variations of Dark World decks. And at number 6, we have Ryza the Mega Monarch. This is a level 8 Wind Wing Beast monster with 20 hundred attack. You can Tribute Summon it for one less Tribute by using a Tribute Summoned monster, and if Ryza is Tribute Summoned, you can target one card in the field and another card in the graveyard and put those targets on top of the deck. Also, if you Tribute a Wind monster, you can target an additional card and return that card to the hand. Ryza the Mega Monarch wasn't used for most of its lifespan. The Monarch decks that sprung up after the release of the Monarch Structure deck in 2016 preferred Erebus and Aether as their Tribute Summon monsters of choice. But Ryza, like the previously listed Miss Valley Apex Avian, gained a new life with the release of Fluinder Reeds. These birds immediately made Ryza not just playable, but game warpingly strong thanks to its combination bouncing and spinning effect. Fluinder Reeds could use the effects of cards like Fluinder Reeds and Robina to summon Ryza on your opponent's turn to spin cards, but perhaps the most dangerous part of Ryza was when you tributed a wind monster, like Fluinder Reeds and Eaglin. This lets you bounce any card in the field, and most often this was used to bounce Ryza itself. This would let you infinitely reuse Ryza's effect, constantly summoning it and making your opponent redraw the same one or two cards, while Flunder Reeves would leverage their own monster's effects to constantly add themselves back to the hand after being tributed. This unlimited loop tribute summon engine created a more modern version of the old school classic Yada Lock, where you would force your opponent to be stuck with the same cards in rotation thanks to constantly stacking cards on top of their deck and recycling Ryza with its own effect. This interaction was powerful enough that for the entirety of Flunder Reese's stay at Tier 1 status, as nearly every single version would always play Ryza, the Mega Monarch. And swooping in at number 5, we have Blackwing Zephros the Elite. This is a level 4 Darkwing Beast monster with 1600 attack. Its effect is that if it's in your graveyard, you can return one face of card you control to the hand to special summon it. Then you take 400 damage for the trouble. This is a very rare once per duel effect. Zephros is one of the most ubiquitous cards in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. Ever since it was released in 2011, it has been in and out of dozens of different kinds of strategies that can find a way to abuse its completely generic special summon from the graveyard that bounces your own cards for value. It's the poster boy for getting a lot of value out of bouncing your own cards. Summon himself is a free plus one, and the bounce itself usually constitutes a card's worth of value as well. Dragon Rulers, Spiral, the previously mentioned Lunalite, and Danger decks, just to name a few, are the tier 1 and sometimes tier 0 strategies that would take advantage of including a single copy of Zephyros. It has incredibly advantageous typing, as being a level 4 dark monster gives it all sorts of easy synergies. Rank 4 strategies love it. Link spam strategies are happy for easy extenders. Decks like Dangers can reuse Dangers that are on field that haven't used their discard effects yet. Lunalite can reuse Lunalite Tiger, just like the previously mentioned Lunalite Yellow Martin. 
Spire would use it to bounce Spire Resort to reuse its Saw Once Per Turn effect, and the list goes on and on. Any deck that could find a way to put Zephros in the graveyard and benefit from a self-bouncing, self-summoning monster would usually find a way to include Zephros. And with no major restrictions on what it can bounce like all the previous cards on this list, it was splashed any and everywhere for years. If all of this wasn't enough, it was still seeing play until this most recent couple of ban lists in Danger Tulemon decks, thanks to being a high value random mill off the Tyramid Millers, as well as being a great monster for making Curious Lightsworn Dominion, thanks to its dark attribute and wing based typing being different from the Dangers and Tulemons. That all on top of the already mentioned synergies of Dangers. You could even put Tier Limits Havenus back in your hand to have it ready for your opponent's next turn if you happen to summon it to the field. There's no end to the list of amazing decks Zephros has had cameos in, and that's in no small part due to its ability to bounce your own cards. And at number 4 on this list, we have Bryonic Dragon of the Ice Barrier. This is a level 6 Water Sea Serpent Synchro Monster with 2300 attack. And as for its effect, we're talking about the version that existed before the errata, which stated you can discard any number of cards, then return that same number of cards from the field to the hand. This effect had no once per turn, and allowed you to bounce your own cards, unlike modern Bryonic. You can't really list all the decks in which Bryonic was a core part of, because for the longest time, Bryonic was the go-to level 6 synchro monster in nearly all decks during the 5D's era of Yu-Gi-Oh. So, it would be in every deck for dozens of different competitive archetypes, as synchro summoning was the name of the game. Its ability to turn every card in your hand into a bounce made it great at picking apart boards without losing your own board presence, like a Black Rose Dragon might cost you. The card was always good. But the most degenerate thing it can do was, of course, enable absurd FDKs with its unlimited ability to bounce your own cards. Early on in Bryonic's lifespan, players figured out you could repeatedly bounce Future Fusion and Level Eater with Bryonic, which would eventually lead to a loop that would allow you to draw your entire deck, make a Tempest Magician, and discard your hand for 8,000 damage. And this entire combo happened off a single activation of Future Fusion, which itself could set up Bryonic. And while it was primarily used to clear boards, its self-bouncing ability was still incredibly powerful for years able to enable plays like bouncing back an Infernity Archfiend to your hand, emptying your hand with the cost of the effect, and getting to use Infernity Archfiend's special summon and search effect again. Or in a deck like Six Samurai, which could abuse Bryonic to recycle a monster that could special summon itself, like legendary Six Samurai Kizen, to continuously add Bushido counters to Gateway of the Six and Six Samurai United. The card's infinite discards and bounces would only become a bigger problem as more and more cards were printed, and eventually it received an errata in 2017 to prevent any more future abuse making its effect once per turn, and only usable on your opponent's cards. It's not hard to imagine what a pre errata Bryonic might have been capable of accomplishing with a more modern card pool, and very little good could come of it. And hopping into number 3, we have Swap Frog. This is a level 2 water aqua monster that can special summon itself by discarding one water monster from your hand. On summon, you can send a level 2 or lower water aqua monster from your deck to the graveyard. Also, on a soft once per turn, you can return one monster you control to the hand and gain an additional normal summon for one frog monster for that turn though the additional normal summon was only once per turn. Swap Frog is the heart and soul of the infamously powerful Frog Engine, which revolves primarily around Swap Frog's ability to put Ronin Toad in the graveyard and abuse its lack of a heart once per turn and ability to summon itself from the graveyard to enable all sorts of combos. The Frog Engine has been a staple of meta-relevant decks going all the way back to 2010, where Swap Frog's ability to special summon itself and dump a Treeborn Frog to the graveyard was set up Monarch decks, even before the release of cards like Ronin Toad. In. Perhaps the most infamous and powerful frog deck was Frog FTK, which abused Substitute to cycle through over 20 different frog monsters and then summon Rodent Tonin and other frogs enough times to kill on the first turn with Mass Driver. Swap Frog was critical to this, as he needed to get both Substitute and a frog on the field to tribute, and Swap Frog was the primary way to do this. Substitute's power centralized the engine, but with its eventual ban, the Swap Frog Rodent Toad duo became the core of the deck across several years, in decks including Fish OTK, Frog Paleozoic, and most recently the preferred secondary engine to Sprite, before Ronin Toad and Swap places on the ban list with Substitute. Swap Frog's ability to special summon itself put a body on the board to enable Sprite's special summon abilities while setting up Ronin Toad in the graveyard for future extensions, and bounce itself back to the hand gives you the exact same playline all over again. This gave Frog Sprite one of the deck's most consistently and robust engines in the modern format to complement Sprite's inherent high power level and ceiling. It's in no small part Swap Frog's doing that Ronin Toad and Sprite L found their way onto the most recent ban list and it still sees some play in sprite variants today that rely on nimble monsters, despite the loss of Ronin Toten. Sweeping into the number 2 spawn this list, we have Giant True Nade. This is a spell card with the relatively simple effect to return all spell and trap cards in the field to their owner's hand. True Nade is the oldest card on this list, and the patient zero for the idea that bouncing your own cards in the field can be incredibly broken. Back in Giant True Nade's heyday, it was largely used as an extra copy of effects like Cold Wave or Heavy Storm to clear your opponent's back row out of the way before you commit to your own place. 
But even back then, Trunade had some degenerate things it could do. Giant Trunade's most infamous early abuse case was how it interacted with Premature Burial. Since Premature Burial only destroys the equipped monster when it was destroyed, Trunade would let you bypass that condition by only bouncing it to your hand, leaving the monster on the field and allowing for another activation of Premature Burial. This could quickly get out of hand even in early Yu-Gi-Oh! with a card like Priorata Dark Magician of Chaos, letting you return Trunade to the hand, activating Premature Burial on another Dark Magician of Chaos, do it again, until you had three 2000 attack beaters in the field a still usable premature burial in hand, and whatever other spell you want out of your graveyard. Interactions like this got Dark Magician of Chaos limited, banned, and eroded in due time. Even outside degenerate combos, Trunade was, and still would be, extremely problematic in the game because of how it interacts with Floodgates. It could allow decks to flip a card like Skill Drain on your opponent's turn, lock them out of their strategy for a turn, and only go for your own push once you activate a Trunade to free you from your own Floodgate. It could recur insane value off of cards that plus you an activation but remain in the field, like Fire Formation 10 key or even cards with no once per turns like Spiral Resort. And it does this all while clearing your opponent's back row interaction at the same time. It says a lot about Giant Trunade's power level when a card like Harpy's Feather Duster is legal at 1, but Trunade remains banned. Or more specifically, how it's retrained, Hey Trunade has no impact because it only bounces face down cards, not allowing you to recycle your own face up spells and traps like Giant Trunade did. Giant Trunade has been banned since 2011, specifically because it can bounce your own face up spells and traps and will likely never be on ban for that distinction. And finally, at number 1, we have another pre errata monster with Firewall Dragon. This is a Link 4 Light Cybers monster with 2500 attack that could, once while face up on the field, bounce monsters on the field or graveyard up to the number of monsters co-linked with it as a quick effect. And before the errata, if a monster it pointed to was destroyed by battle or sent to the graveyard, you could special summon one monster from your hand. Firewall Dragon is one of the most legendary monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh's history from a power level standpoint. It was the first truly broken Link monster, as it doubled as both a powerful end board piece with its bounce effect, but an even more absurd combo enabler with its pre rod effect to special summon monsters and bounce your own monsters to your hand. The core issue of Firewall Dragon's design is that Link summoning existed, meaning you could send any monster you summon to a Link Zone Firewall pointed to to the graveyard for a different Link summon, giving you a free special summon from hand. There was no hard once per turn on its summoning effect, and its first effect to bounce was only a soft once per turn, meaning you could use its bounce effects as many times as you could summon Firewall Dragon. This meant you could continually summon more Firewall Dragons, bouncing more cards like the ones you linked off for Firewall, and special some of the monsters you bounced from your graveyard to the field. While Firewall Dragon was powerful enough to be used in basically any deck during the Link era for how good it was, it was most notable for how it constantly broke formats over and over until its banning in later errata. Originally, it was broken by Tier 0 Spiral decks extra deck locking people thanks to Master Roll 3's rulings in Firewall, making it trivial for Spirals to perform a U-Link, taking up both extra monster zones by co-linking from one to the other. Next up was Topologic Gumblar Dragon Handloom decks, most notably the Goki variants, where Firewall would bounce Goki monsters from your graveyard to the hand in a massive co-link setup to fuel your Gumblar's hand-destroyed abilities, while also making the co-linking for Gumblar fairly easy with its special summoning. Even worse were the abundant different FTK decks abusing Dangers, Dark Worlds, and Cannon Soldier, though Firewall's bouncing capabilities weren't central to the strategy outside of potentially reusing Dangers to draw more cards. Firewall Dragon, before its errata, is arguably the most powerful extra deck monster in the history of the game, and that's in no small part due to how its own effect to bounce cards enabled its broken special summoning capability. There's just no other cards that can bounce your own cards that dominated as much as Firewall Dragon, earning it the top spot on this list. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other self-bouncing cards you think should have made this list, or are there any other topics you'd like to cover in future videos? If so, leave those suggestions down in the comments below.